Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, we have the Orlando, the Perf, as well as a quick mention of the Philippine Regional League, which was actually the same weekend as the EYC. Essentially that next chapter post EYC, how the meta has been adapting in the regional tournaments. Uh, really interesting stuff to see. And Charizard did continue to dominate as a quick spoiler, we're going to start by looking at the uh, meta game breakdown from day one of Orlando, where we see Charizard continues to be over 20% of that day one field. Obviously, it won the tournament by Tord, one of the most like recognized and popular players, uh, with a very creative deck list that changes kind of the matchup spread of Charizard overall. But also, we saw just generally very high placements of Charizard. And of course, this is only a week out from the EYC, so I'm sure many players would have already already decided on playing Charizard and then just made a few tweaks to their deck list in that final build up to the tournament. So a number of American players may not have had the chance to attend the EYC, but still wanted to get that first regional under their belt in this format. Then the next most popular deck is actually sub 10%. So a real sort of confusion around what the other best decks in the format are. Charizard on that pedestal right now. And we're all sort of vying for what is the next best choice. Chen Pao came out the second most popular at 9.5%. Still having that very, very strong game plan. Also, I think it helps the fact that Charizard players for the most part of the EYC were teching for control and that actually gives some Chen Pao protection knowing that with Charizard now being a bad matchup for control does it make control a worse choice in the tournament which then means Chen Pao has to worry a little bit less of hitting those control decks meaning you're hitting more of those favorables or at least even matchups so you're actually pretty nicely covered with Chen Pao I think this will be evolving throughout the formats based on sort of where the techs lie there might be certain weeks where Charizards are teching for mirror matches more than control and then control's a good deck again so monitoring these techs is also going to open the door sometimes for the likes of Chen Pao to be better positioned going into this tournament. Future Hands also coming off a really nice EYC placement was the third most popular deck. Not too surprising to see players defaulting back to aggressive fast archetypes to win those best of threes in 50 minutes with quite a low skill floor to the deck as well that can still accumulate a huge number of wins. Then we have Giratina, kind of that other side of the coin where it's a very complex archetype with very close 50-50 matchups almost across the board. Obviously Isaiah got second place at the EYC with the pretty creative list of Bennett. I'm sure there'll be some players adapting that Bennett and certainly some people chopping out that line to sort of revert back to more traditional lists. Roaring Moon then made it onto the day one graphic as one of the more popular decks, almost that 8% there. Had a really good showing at the EYC with the Dedun Sparse list making top eight, but also in the senior division, the Ancient Box was able to win. So it does feel like the Vengeance Fletching stocks are really rising recently. I imagine this build is going to be that Dedun Sparse list over many others, but I wouldn't be surprised if Ancient Box was kind of knocking on that door slightly under Lugia's play rate, but still around probably that five or so percent, I would imagine. And then we have Lugia kind of just barely hanging on honestly, with less than 7% of the play rate. This was expected going into the EYC to be one of the top contenders. I think possibly that lack of top 8 placement combined with the fact that Future Hands did really, really well and does farm the Lugia deck quite aggressively may have put a number of Lugia pilots off. That said, again, with this sort of revolving meta that we might be coming into, sort of figuring out those second and third most popular decks each tournament, I'm certain there's going to be an uptick once again of Lugia at some point when we start seeing that control edge back up in popularity. It still has quite a decent time into Charizard, and essentially it only really has to monitor that future hands matchup. It's also worth noting that Lugia is also sort of benefiting from the uptick of these ancient decks as well, which I think in general is quite favorable for Lugia. And then for the day two breakdown, the positioning of all the decks are actually the same, except for the Moon to Dunsparce, which fell off a little bit from day one to day two, and Ancient Box sort of crept in and pushed that Lugia along a little bit as well. So every deck had reasonable conversion. These seem to be some of the top contenders in the game. There's going to be that battle of the Dunsparce versus the higher Ancient Count, Ancient Box deck, of which is going to be the stronger build. But it does look like these are the six strategies right now that are doing the best in the game. Control is never really going to have that wave of popularity behind it. And of course, there's the headache of these Charizards that are very heavily teched, really, with Yell Cheer, Double Churro from Tord. But in terms of metagame placement, it's a harder to justify archetype. But then we have the top eight deck and player breakdown. There were two Charizards making it into top eight. Once again, we have Luke Morser, aka Celio's Network, getting his first top eight placement. Very happy for him. Gives him some extra coaching credits. 
because I know he has taken some flack for not getting a top eight up to now. We then have 2022 senior world champion Liam Halliburton. Liam is mad as a box of frogs. He has been somewhat of a control scientist over the last few formats, and he is very vocal on both Twitter and the Trash Lunch podcast, so definitely make sure to listen to those over the next couple of weeks to hear more from him. We then have Josh Frink with Gardevoir. Obviously, this archetype bubbled in the EUIC, but has now made it into a top eight. Once again, reinforcing that this is a good contender in the format. We have Reagan making top eight with Chen Pao. They have been piloting this since the start of the year, I think. So they found their archetype and are sticking true to it with some great results along the way. And I think this is their deepest run with the deck so far. Cyrus McCain is flying that flag of Roaring Moon to Dunspar. So even though it didn't have great day one to day two conversion, it's once again found itself into top eight. Also, Tina equally making another top eight placement in the hands of Brandon Dean. Looks like Fabrizio's found his post-rotation archetype now that they can no longer play Mew and are sticking with Chen Pao over the last couple of tournaments and have had two very good placements so far. Top 32 at the EUIC and also now a top eight here. And it rounds out with Jake playing that ancient box. Going into the details of the deck list themselves, we have Liam's winning 60. This is actually just the same 60 that Tord piloted, except it's playing one of the 70 hit point Charmanders. Other than that, it's an unapologetic carbon copy, and it's a great result with the deck once again. Jumping down to Celio's top eight Charizard list, this is more of a mash. You have the Clefa, you have the Barry, you have the Prime Catcher, but then sneaking in a couple of tech cards for the mirror match, adding in a second copy of Charmeleon so you're less affected by TM Devolution, and then playing your own TM Devolution to try and catch the opponent off guard. We then have Jake's second place Ancient Box compared to uh, Vinny's winning list from the EUIC. Just a couple card changes, incorporating one copy of Great Tusk for that land collapse option, taking out one of the Corridons, still having that same count of Ancient cards within the deck list, and then simply added a space for the Lost Vacuum in the deck over an Ultra Ball. As well as adding the very cheeky Fire Energy so that you are able to use the Shred attack, so you do give yourself an out against Neuverni X, so possibly respecting some of the Pidgeot control that did well at the EUIC. Josh's Gardevoir list was pretty interesting, does have that Clef Key Flutter main combination, is playing as many as three copies of the Counts Catcher in the list, and is also continuing to play that Eerie Supporter, because you grow such a decent hand size as you get towards mid-game situations and you're not getting hit with Iona in a number of matchups, you can still snipe some pretty important cards from a number of matchups. Then we have the two Chen Pao lists. We'll start with Reagan's 60, where it is playing the three copies of the Chen Pao. Also has the Iron Bundle in the 60 to try and push things out the way. Interestingly, is choosing to play no copies of Counter Catcher whatsoever and just is sticking with Prime, but does have the Silene option in the deck list to give you potential reloads of the likes of Prime Catcher, but also giving you a few more resources, certainly against Eerie, which can show up in Charizard now, can show up in Controlling Barracks, can show up in Arceus. There are a lot of decks playing Eerie. I just mentioned Guardi could even be playing it. So... If you're getting hit with Devolution and sniped with Eeries, you have Silene for Rare Candy, you have Energy Retrievals coming back. Just a really versatile card to have in the list. It never feels good to have to flip coins to make this happen, but it does still have great internal synergy with the deck, and let's face it, getting extra use of Prime Catcher is pretty busted. Comparing it to Fabrizio's list, who has incorporated one copy of Iono, also plays that bundle, but does still have the Counter Catcher in the 60, and is going down to just two copies of the Pokestop, having a vacuum in here as well. Ultimately, we know that Chen Pao is so focused on getting those ratios right, you can only really change one or two cards within the list, so it does seem like it's coming to an exact science at this point, where we're getting very, very close between the 60s. Cyrus's Moon Dead Donsparce, again, is not too different at all from the EUIC 60 from Mark, uh, where I believe it's just a stadium change where the Temple of Sino comes in to try and respect Mist Energy, which could be going into Lugia list, but also could be used to checkmate you with Neuverni X, or just having uh, Mist Energy on like Charizard or whatnot as a response to Roaring Moon's success in the previous week. Uh, it seems like a reasonable include in the list. I do think Artisan is absolutely busted in this deck list, so I'd actually take away a shoe space rather than an Artisan, because that stadium is busted in this list to reload those dunts throughout the entire game. And then we end on uh, Brandon's Giratina list, which does have a few cheeky tricks up its sleeve. It does play the Thornton in the list, which could be really good uh, for reloading potential Iron Leaves, allowing you to have one prize board states in late game scenarios against Charizard. That little bit more, which is even more important now, by the way, because of how Charizard can force their way down to one prize board states, knowing that they can use the likes of Churro and Collab to even pick up things like Pidgeot and then just have Bibarel plus Radzard as like an end game combination, knowing that they can work towards Red Candy Zard to be their finisher if you put many two prizes into play. My main question mark is seeing a third copy of Buddy Buddy Puffin over just playing an Artisan, because I do want to have ways of unlocking my Jet Energy as well when we are in those controlling matchups. Possibly the Thornton can help out in this regard as well, where you can transform one of your trapped Goobers that gets hit with Erika's potentially, and you can turn it into something more useful. That said, the deck's already playing Spiritomb, which can give you a lot of percentage points 
starting to control regardless. Moving over to the Perth Regional Championships then, it was much more of a Charizard whitewash where there were five of the top eight decks. Actually, three of them were the exact same list as well. Kaiwin, Rahul and Max all played the exact same 60 that we'll look at in a moment. With the top eight being rounded out by one Lugia, one Lost Zone Box, as well as one other Roaring Moon to Dunsparce. So, so far, of the three regionals, only Charizard and Moon to Dunsparce has made it into the top eight of both regionals and the EYC, which is a pretty wild stat to say. Getting into those lists then, uh, once again, Kaiwin, Rahul, and Max all played this 60, so first and two top eight placements for this one, where it feels like the Aussie list that was developed in the EYC has made those quick adaptations to weave in the 1 1 bit barrel package on their own end to again give you more control over a prize race in mirror matches and in other multi-prize matchups. We've got the eerie TM Devo combo in the 60. You've got that Reggie Lecky, which can be a real nuisance in mirror matches and other situations to make yourself that little bit more infinite, I suppose. It feels like everyone is jumping on this Charizard bandwagon and is basically stealing the best elements of Tord 60 uh, and incorporating it into their own lists and are having great results with the deck over and over again. Jordan Partners' second place list was also quite different. It incorporated a Hero's Cape as a, a spec over playing Prime Catcher, even though it did play the Barrel in the 60. A couple of things that I thought was interesting because you're not playing the Prime Catcher in part, but also adding new synergies to the deck is having one copy of Double Turbo Energy. It of course can be used to retreat Barrel if that card is trapped, but it also enables your Pidgeot to attack with one attachment. And especially with Magma Base in the list, you're actually playing similar to a Pidgeot Control where you can burst this Radzard onto the board much more quicker than expected in a number of situations. So Jordan's really sort of divvied up the controlling aspect of the deck by having Palpad, Devo, Airy, potential to use Hero's Cape, Penny in certain situations with Pokemon to buy yourself time potentially or set up damage across certain Pokemon, but then still has that monster late game of Charizard EX just blowing things up. Brent Tonneson also kind of sticking true to his EUIC list, did choose to play the Prime Catcher but wasn't playing the Bit Barrel in the list, instead went for the double Eerie plus Devo, really trying to tech for those mirror matches by the looks of things and improving your time into Chen Pao. Also sticking with that Reggie Lecky in the list, so it's something I need to experiment with a little bit more because you can force your opponent into really weird situations with the sonar getting back key resources and making the opponent take one in certain spots. You really are just laying a trap for them to then make your math work out that little bit better with Burning Darkness to cash in on having a two-prizer in play. Finally, moving away from all the Charizard chatter, we do have uh, the Lost Zone box that made top four with Gitano. Uh, very similar to Pedro's list from the EYC where it is playing those five two-prize Pokemon. The Moon, Hands, Raikou, Hooper, and Mew EX. Does have the bundle to respect the Flutter Mains, which are kind of popping up with Ancient Box being a more respected deck. And also that Spiritomb to give yourself some extra help against control and slowing down those Charizards as well. It's insane that this card that was essentially printed just for Genesect is now seeing so much play to stop Rotom V of all things. But beyond that, it's the similar sort of quad rod gate combination that we have seen time and time again of Lost Box in this new format. Then we have Tim's Moon to Dunsparce list. Again, just that Temple of Sinnoh coming in. Interesting that both players who made top eight with the deck made this adaptation where they were adding in the Sinnoh to give yourself a little bit more respect around Mist. I believe the difference between those two 60s was that Tim chose to play the one rod three Moon EX that we initially saw from the EYC, whereas Cyrus was playing double rod plus just two EXs. So still one card different between them, but cool that they both made that same adaptation and went far with the list. Then rounding out that top eight, we do have Lugia. Some really interesting choices going on in here, where we have two Research as well as two Morty's Conviction to add to your sort of discarding count. Really interesting is that there's Prime Catcher in the list instead of Master Ball. It's obvious that Prime Catcher is absolutely busted, but saying no to Master Ball to just reduce your odds of a summon feels so weird to me. Also, this list is choosing to play a relatively low count of those Ball Search cards and is only playing three copies of the Lugia, which also makes me a little bit concerned. And then just to round things off, just to have not missed this out, the Philippine Regional League was the same weekend as the EYC, so the first tournament of Temporal Forces Legal, and actually seven of the top eight decks were Charizard. One of them was a bit barrel build, six of them were Pidgeot, and then the final list was Gardevoir. Uh, I feel like we've spoken Charizard to death at this point, but I will just show off the winning list just for another quick conversation, because there were a couple other cards in here. In the 60, we do see the Gouging Fire EX to give yourself possibly an earlier game, higher damage output play in the list. Also having that Choice Belt, so Gouging Fire can get through some V-Star Pokemon a little bit more aggressively. And the list is also incorporating Mist Energy, which we haven't seen too much in Charizard as of late, but does give you some protection against Devo, which is a really popular tech right now and is also pretty good against Roaring Moon which is again upticking and has made top eight at all of these tournaments so far. But yeah I feel like we don't really want to look at uh, six more lists of Charizard. I think we've done that chapter now and the deck continues to uh, perform really nicely. Let me know your thoughts down below. Uh, what percentage of play do you think Charizard's going to get at the next tournament? I'll hear it down below and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Cheers!